All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me? We do that prerequisite Zoom query. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Well, so wonderful to see all of you and thank you all for coming. And it's a, a pleasure to have journalist Patrick Sims, journalist and author Patrick Sims with us today sharing uh, his research and ideas. Um, my name is Jeff Shumway. I am the faculty coordinator of Latin American studies. Um, and again, welcome here to the Kennedy Center. Um, great way to send off the semester with, with this great, uh, great talk today. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Patrick Sims uh, briefly and then turn the time over to him. Um, we'll be handling, there will be some time for a question and answer session toward the end. Um, Patrick, some, some students, some people have to start leaving at 10 2, but, but we can continue on with the question and answer session. So you can uh, raise your hand to get in line to ask uh, Patrick Sims a question, or you can send it to the, in, through the chat if you would like uh, me or Corey Leonard to, to ask the question for you. Um, all right. Well, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Patrick Sims, who is originally from New Haven, Connecticut, but grew up in Virginia. He received his BA in government from Wesleyan University. Um, he is the author of numerous articles and books, which I think he's gonna talk a little bit about. And he recently completed a Knight Wallace Fellowship in Journalism at the University of Michigan. Uh, and the best thing about Patrick Sims is that he's an avid fisherman. So I had to add that. Um, but we could go on, but I will leave it at that. And let's uh, please join me in giving Patrick Sims a wonderful Zoom welcome. Welcome. Hello there. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a great crowd. Jeff, thank you very much for this invitation um, to speak. And I uh, was just excited. I recently taught a class for Jeff on uh, South America, and I just couldn't resist the opportunity to come back and talk a little bit about my current project, uh, which is a book on authoritarianism around the world and how it teaches us about what's happening in the United States. Um, and Patrick, I can you want your video, Patrick, can you put your video on? Sorry. We don't see your video right now. I'm going to join that. But, oh, it's funny. It is listed. There we go. We... Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. There we no, go. No, please interrupt as necessary. Um, so it's good to get a technical fail out of the way right at the start. Um, I sort of claim to be here because as a journalist and a writer, I'm trying to do a sort of parallel form of knowledge development to what the kind of research that's done in the academy that students are doing, that scientists are doing. Uh, I sometimes, you know, like to say that what I'm doing is ground truthing ideas through journalism based overseas, mostly in Latin America. Um, and will you give me up my first slide there and let's start going through and I'll just try to quickly summarize my background in two minutes so we can talk about Latin America and authoritarianism. Um, the, uh, um, and give me that that first set of pictures, which is that's just to, to establish my credentials here. This is uh, reporting I did around the world on insurgencies and revolutionary movements um, and my sort of claim to fame. The guy over on the right with the mustache, the short guerrilla commander is Simon Trinidad, who was one of the most famous guerrilla commanders in Colombia and ended up getting arrested and is sitting in jail right now. So I had a chance to, you know, into the 90s, you know, report Brazil, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, places that uh, I continue to be fascinated by. And can I show you the next one with some of my articles and books, um, which uh, I've mostly been, this is my first book that came out of visits to Cuba. I became fascinated by Che Guevara. And I'll just mention briefly, um, that I traveled around South America for that one, uh, researching uh, guerrilla groups and Che Guevara's influence in the world. How about the next one, please? Um, and I've been a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine, 
uh, for many years covering Latin America, especially Cuba. And I wrote two books about Cuba. And for me, what has brought me here is the desire to sort of ground journalism and real history in very factual researched history um, and to go deep in book length, uh, I, even in long form journalism, you know, to try to really use almost novelistic ideas about long form writing and the atmosphere to tell a deep story, but one that's rooted in, you know, genuine rigorous history. And uh, I, as I developed this obsession with Cuba and the dictatorship there, I sort of grew in my thinking more and more fascinated by these extremist groups and uh, decided that, you know, they, 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 they have sort of faded away as dictatorships. Let's jump forward one slide and I'll show you a little bit about my uh, sort of intellectual development from studying all those groups. Um, I was trying to blend history into my journalism. And I looked at Cuba and these places and was seeing, you know, I was in Burma quite a long time ago, really dictatorships or closed systems run by narrow people. That's not what I'm talking about today. It's really the second entry here, the authoritarian system that we're seeing spreading in, the, in Europe, in the United States, uh, in many parts of the world right now. And authoritarianism, is ultimately driven by the, 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 the tension or polarization in society, the divisions between groups in society. It blames outsiders, the outgroup, the elites for all the problems in a society or most of them, maybe immigrants in one context. And we're gonna talk about three examples today, um, two in Latin America and one outside of it. And I, uh, also differentiate here between, you know, closely related ideas like populism, which can have a left or right variant, demagoguery, which is a style, but has more to do with the way you communicate than any platform. Authoritarianism, I think is powerful and dangerous because it is ultimately a system, right? Uh, and the quote at the top, by the way, against systems, uh, I've just explained my system for thinking about authoritarianism. Uh, but I'm under the influence of the anthropologist Guillermo O'Donnell, who wrote a great important book about transitions to democracy in Latin America. It's a landmark work from the 1980s. And O'Donnell studied, you know, this situation that was fluid where countries in Latin America that had been dictatorships were becoming more democratic. I'm sort of looking at a phenomenon going in the other direction as countries become less democratic in some ways. But O'Donnell was also, he, what it was important, he defined the idea of transition, that it's something changing that's going on, not necessarily which direction it's changing. And he said, in changing situations, context matters, particularity matters, individual nations and actors and states and policies and cultural differences determine what happens. And he said, you should be against systems. And I'm putting the air quotes around that phrase, against systems. So I do think we're in a moment of transition and all these countries I'm about to discuss have very particular blends, but I began to realize from long experience being exposed to reporting in these countries that there are common elements. The authoritarian impulse is a worldwide phenomenon right now. Um, and let's jump forward one system uh, and I'll talk about some of the particulars, excuse me, jump forward one slide if we can. Um, I, uh, 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 Professor Shumway mentioned I was a fellow at the University of Michigan last year, class of 2020 as a Knight Wallace fellow in journalism. And I had proposed to them, you know, I said, I have this scattered reporting on these places on the ground experience, but I need, I need a deeper understanding. And it was great. I got to spend a year at the university uh, researching authoritarianism and political science, philosophy and anthropology. And I wanna mention a couple of the conclusions that leap out of this research. Um, the sort of godfather of, of authoritarianism studies is Theodore Adorno. And in the era right after World War II, he established that you know, about one third of American men had strongly authoritarian impulses, a tendency toward violence, 
conformity, a belief that they were threatened by outgroups and nonconformism. Um, and it was pretty startling finding, you know, with sociological approaches, doing quizzes and so on. And his methods were imperfect, his theories were imperfect, but it, what's shocking is that that research not only holds up today in America, but it holds up pretty much worldwide. Um, and Karen Stenner in Australia has documented, you know, worldwide similar attitudes and even goes as far as saying it's probably a innate personality trait that we just some of us strongly prefer authoritarian leadership systems, black and white lines, um, and turn against outsiders. Um, I also had a chance to study with some influential people there. Um, and I want to note the work of Robert Ronald Inglehart, uh, who has run the Human Values Survey, which is a mass, mass, uh, perhaps the largest data collection ever on sociological research and results and psychology and testing worldwide, the biggest sort of data dump of opinion information. And the World Values Survey is the proper name of it. Um, and it's mostly social scientists and tons of polling data. And it's quite striking the difference between what's happening in the rest of the world, the global trend, and what's happening perhaps in the United States, um, which is to say that uh, Ronald Inglehart uses this frame post-materialism, meaning there's a huge shift in people's values and ideas about authority and politics when you get enough to eat, when you get a roof over your head, when you get your material needs met, you become more generous, you become more focused on protecting the rights of individuals, of tolerating different cultures. Uh, that there, there, There's a sort of threshold where societies show an increase in sort of classically liberal values about equality. And it's the threshold met when more and more people have their basic material needs met. So post-materialism is in that sense, classical liberalism and Engelhardt has um, got a lot of data to back that up. But the one place that's somewhat different is the United States. The data shows that attitudes about authority in the United States are pretty much holding steady, even as we have grown and become more prosperous uh, as a nation. Um, and I was also very struck by the work of the political science professor, Robert Mickey, who talked about and teaches about organizations and parties and what's happening in the United States. He uh, starts his class by pointing out that, you know, his, his specialty is the stability of American democracy. And he said, I used to, you know, before 2016, he used to teach in a room with sort of seven students. <laughs> and he said that all, all of us who teach in this field could fit around a conference table. But since 2016, American democracy has become a hot button issue and suddenly he teaches in a convention hall and uh, you know, their, their gatherings are covered by the New York Times. Um, and it is important to remember, and I'll try to talk at the end about solutions and ways to address authoritarianism, but uh, you know, politics is, is about organizations and institutions and democracy has in the past in the US been held together by those parties. So the, the, the organizational and party thing is a little more important than some of us might like to admit. And, and lastly, I'll mention the work of Dan Slater, uh, poli -Sci, chair of the poli -Sci department in Michigan, who corrected me because I began saying, well, democracy is in retreat or democracy in such and such country is in retreat. And he said, well, not in their opinion, you know, they see democracy as expanding. And what he's talking about is a different kind of democracy, majoritarian democracy, the will of the mass, you know, basically, as you will talk about some examples, but, you know, Hungary is a great example of a country that set the template really for, you know, blaming outsiders like immigrants, which barely exist in Hungary for problems using a lot of threats of against the media and the elite and the academy and building this sort of populist party um, and spreading this example of, you know, retreating rights, but they call it majoritarian. The most people support it. We're going to use democracy just to get power. And when we're in power, we just do what we want. There's no more norms or checks and balances. So majoritarian democracy 
may be spreading and is completely compatible with an authoritarian uh, world. And uh, the last thing I'll say about my research is I had a lot of time on this wonderful fellowship to read a lot of the great authors in the bookshelves right now are filled with books about authoritarianism. I've got a bunch of them here. Um, Timothy Snyder from Yale, very popular historian. Uh, Anne Applebaum wrote a book, Twilight of Democracy, which uh, has many good points. How Democracies Die by uh, Levitsky and Z. Blatt has become a New York Times bestseller. It's this very dry academic tome. I learned a lot from this research, but I have noted something, which is virtually all the research on authoritarianism is only occurring in the library at Yale. This is anthropology written by professors and you know, with respect to that, that's critical, but I am trying to do something different, which is to marry that with the field work of journalism and to test these ideas in the streets. So let me show you a little bit about how that went. Can we jump to the next slide? Um, and the uh, bottom line here about what's going on in authoritarianism is group status and economic anxiety make people feel threatened. And um, Pippa, Nora Pippin of Harvard has this theory called the cultural backlash theory, which you know she's just got a ton of data showing that in the US, Older white people, very disproportionately male, fear a loss of group status and are feeling hostile to cultural change that they don't recognize that's too fast. Um, and that's what makes people feel vulnerable and threatened in the United States and drives a lot of support for more authoritarian ideas here. All right, let's jump ahead one more, please. So three examples. Um, I went reporting, uh, this, this presentation is called Maracaibo at Midnight because of a story I'm about to tell you about what happened at midnight in Maracaibo when you try to take your theoretical research on authoritarianism and populism out into the streets of countries and see you know, how does it hold up. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't always go well. Um, you know, I went reporting in Venezuela when Hugo Chavez was still alive. He was a very genuine populist in the sense that I think he, you know, despite problems with the elections, he, he, he was the will of the Venezuelan people at that time. Um, and he wanted to distribute goods. He was great at giving stuff away. He would open factories with no customers. He would build dairies with no cows. He would redistribute freely. Um, under Nicolas Maduro, the country has become profoundly corrupt, uh, crime, corruption were always a problem. This goes back, you know, this is in a country that's been polarized for 70 years. This is basically what polarization does to societies. Um, and what amazed me about Venezuela and its continuing crisis and development year after year after year is that they've basically, there is a way to use an authoritarian ruling class to limit, to control the people with scarcity. I saw this in Cuba where everybody has to be on the ration and ask the government to get you your rice and beans. So it's hard to disassociate yourself from the government. In the case of Venezuela, they, you know, one of the most propelling factors in all authoritarianism is the division between us and them, in group and out group. In the case of Venezuela, those loyal to the revolution and those against it, which generally goes by neighborhood or city. Um, but scarcity becomes a source of control. And the Venezuelans have sort of built this permanent systematic corruption where everyone depends on someone else to survive. Um, and the, you know, the legitimacy of the, re, the government that may have once existed under Chavez has eroded and elections are merely a veneer, uh, just a veneer of democracy, just enough to have that claim to legitimacy, at least in front of your own supporters. Um, and so the division in the society really became sort of 50-50 in Venezuela, which is, um, I was always amazed that they managed to hold on, but when you hold the resources of the government and, and uh, the loyalty of 50% of the people, uh, they, they've held on for long after I left Venezuela. Um, let's jump ahead and look at the case of Venezuela and uh, the, the sort of right populism. Um, 
Bolsonaro is, the, uh, and by the way, that's a photo of me in Rio de Janeiro in the favela called Cantalago. Um, and I'll point out that those are, are paintball guns that they're holding, uh, but in the old days, it wasn't paintball guns. So I had done a lot of reporting at different parts of Brazil, and uh, this was the first time they weren't real guns. Uh, you know, Bolsonaro has been called the model of the modern media savvy authoritarian. He took advantage of a crisis and corruption of others to come to power. What's very striking about him is he probably wouldn't admit this now, but he used to admire Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and praise Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and talk about, I want that model to come here. That was one of his early political ideas. Um, Chavez was a hard left statist. Bolsonaro was kind of a hard right free market guy, but the emotional terrain for authoritarian leaders looks pretty similar. They both, uh, survive by constantly attacking others. They over, you know, try to control legislatures and blame students and professors and journalists and artists and homosexuals. Bolsonaro is very often attacking, you know, cultural targets and using cultural symbols. You know, the gun when he speaks at events, he he waves even imaginary guns around, although he's often been told with real guns. Threats of violence are part of the sort of appeal of many authoritarians that they're gonna, you know, smash the bad guys. Um, and, uh, you know, he surrounds himself with violent people. And if you keep threatening, you know, you have a, to cite specifically the case of this murder in Rio, there was a city councilwoman from one of the favelas in Rio who criticized Bolsonaro sharply and attacked him and Bolsonaro hated and despised her and ranted on face, Facebook against her. What happened next, I think says a lot about how authoritarianism works in politics. It depends on either violence or the demonstration of symbolic violence. In this case, the woman was shot dead. Who shot her? Well, the guy who got out of a car, whose car was that? The car that drove the assassin to the murder scene where this councilwoman was killed was driven by Bolsonaro's immediate next door neighbor, who is a former military officer, served time in jail for a previous murder, runs a network of ultra-right, figures connected to so-called militias in Rio and other parts of the country, has surrounded himself with these killers and tough guys. And so I'm fascinated by that connection between the politician saying, you know, she's scum and I hate her. And then someone going out and carrying out those orders because they're not direct orders. Bolsonaro didn't order her assassination. He just talked about how horrible she was. But people know how to listen um, and follow instructions. And she gets shot by someone who's riding the car driven by Bolsonaro's friend, supporter, neighbor. So I'm always looking for the fingerprints of how there's a connection there between political speech and violence on the streets, because I think the threat of violence is fundamental to majoritarian democracies, fundamental to authoritarian politics. Uh, and that, you know clearly is not the case that Bolsonaro ordered her death. But let me look, um, jump ahead to my third example from outside of Latin America. And I should have warned you about this photo. I'm sorry, I meant to uh, warn you that that is a dead body. Um, I talked about Bolsonaro, you know, not ordering killings or assassinations. Uh, there are tremendous similarities between these Latin American experiences and what's going on in other parts of the world. Not so much the so-called center of Europe or North America, but what's often dismissed as the fringe, the global fringe, third world countries and so on. I feel that these are at the center of events. This is where these dramas play out. And this is the Philippines. And I went to report on the sort of same phenomenon I was describing about Bolsonaro, a nationalist populist elected leader, Rodrigo Duterte, who constantly threatened 
a whole class of people in his own country and those people began to die and they began to die in enormous numbers in mysterious ways in the middle of the night. And I played detective. I went for the New York Times Sunday Magazine to investigate these killings, which were basically death squad killings of drug addicts and public enemies and suspected traffickers and overwhelmingly poor people from the slums. And I was amazed that it was so directly linked to the authoritarian tendencies of Rodrigo Duterte. Unlike Bolsonaro, you know, Bolsonaro rants on Facebook. Duterte actually speaks openly and says, kill them. Duterte has spoken again and again and again uh, in this very violent way about, you know, we're gonna wipe out crime. We're gonna kill the criminals. They're cockroaches, they're zombies. Uh, he's used extreme language, even more so than Bolsonaro, even more so than Hugo Chavez or Maduro uh, or other strong men around the world who threaten. So despite the clear evidence that he was encouraging it, that he was telling police and the army, I will cover for you. He didn't suffer any political price for it. He remains popular. He remains in power. He is implicated in driving police death squads to kill thousands and thousands of people without due process. Uh, and he is, you know, will serve out his term and remain popular. What I learned from that is it's all about impunity. Or Bolsonaro, Duterte, you know, he promises all his, he promises it to the police, to the army who carry out these executions, to the criminals who do it for him. He promises them immunity, impunity. Maduro is giving out impunity to his followers because they have to be corrupt to survive. He's sharing, he's wedding them into a cycle of mutual crimes. They're all protected by denying his crime. And that's why someone like Duterte can survive in power even while uh, carrying out some pretty heinous acts that are almost directly linkable to him, All right? And let me jump ahead to the final country I'm gonna focus on. Oh my goodness, does this sound familiar? Um, I had a chance to, you know, deepen the research for this book. I drove across the country twice, particularly during the summer of 2020. I started out in Michigan and the photo in the upper left is the gun march on the capital of Lansing, Michigan, which began very early in the process of the lockdown. Michigan was a leader in lockdown protests and gunmen were allowed into the Michigan Capitol uh, under law and occupied the building or its outsides and so on. And I go up and interview them. I drove through Idaho and you'll notice the guy in the cowboy hat is speaking to an assembly of militias and militia supporters in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho uh, in June of last year. And the bottom photo is I finally got home to Portland, Oregon in June. And uh, the protests that became so famous here were erupting and uh, nightly battles in front of the federal courthouse and tear gas. And that's the, I thought I'll just poke my head around the corner and see what's going on here. And that's the US Federal Marshal Special Operations Group clearing the building. Um, What's going on in the US? Do you recognize elements of authoritarianism here? Maybe on the left, maybe on the right. Uh, the guy in the cowboy hat, hat, Ammon Bundy, is a leader who's trying to, you know, been involved in a lot of land seizures in the West, obviously well known in Nevada. Uh, but this is a, you know, a, a broad populist movement. I saw so much enthusiasm in Idaho at this militia rally with many of the prominent militias present, uh, enormous amounts of conspiracy theories, uh, you know, everything from the earth, flat earthers and chemtrails to 5G to, you know, politics to COVID to everything. And what everyone was enthusiastic about was the gun, the idea that we have been pushed beyond any limits and we have our guns now and we're opting out if anybody tries to deny us we're using the guns. Um, 
And I contrast that with the movement in Portland where the left was so active and Antifa became famous in there and other cities where there is also violence. There is also authoritarian leftism, although that's not, it's a tiny, tiny issue, even here in Portland, that's minuscule, you know, it was 150 people at those protests who were violent in crowds of thousands. Um, but all of those groups, even the ones who are violent, don't accept the legitimacy of the gun in the streets. They were unarmed or almost in every single case there have been incidents. But I draw that contrast because I do think it's important to know this, this sort of cultural authoritarianism of, built around the gun in America and the idea that we can basically opt out of the parts of the US government we no longer think are legitimate. And I believe these groups are arguing that the rules don't apply to them. They don't respect other people. They're rejecting a lot of America. There are extremist groups that showed up at Lansing, like the Boogaloo Boys and the Accelerationists, which are militia groups or splinters of militia groups that talk about you know, the need to just start the war, destroy the society, set a fire, sometimes literally. Um, that's That's not good for America. That's not how we do things. It's a dark vision of our country. I still believe our, you know, at the end of this research that our democracy is very strong. Um, and I wanted to finish uh, by talking about, you know, when you look at authoritarianism and see these strains of it appearing around the world, I guess what I'd say is, there are solutions. Localism is working in America. The desire to win, you know, at the ballot box, even at a local level, win initiatives, build organizations, work together, re re weave that fabric um, of our society so that we don't see each other from extremes and don't see each other from the poles, but are connected back together the way we used to be. And we are fragmented right now. It's very genuine. Um, but I do think, you know, we have ways of getting out of it. Um, and, you know, we don't have to, I hope we don't go down the road of a Venezuela or a Philippines or even a Brazil right now. Uh, these divisions can easily get the best of us. And it's very important. I urge everyone, you know, one of the things I did in this reporting is I'm always trying to cross the line to go to Idaho, to go to the militias and talk to them. That's not where I come from. You know, I'm an East Coast, big city guy. Now I live in Portland, Oregon, I'm in the West, but it's so important that we reach across those lines. Uh, one of the most <laughs> astonishing and fascinating ideas I heard about dealing with extremism and politics is you should, you should cross the political line literally by going, registering for the other party. If you're a Republican, join the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, join the Republican and be a moderating influence there. You know, voting primary is not as a nefarious plot, but as a way of moderating things and, and holding a center for us. Um, I guess I, I'm, I'm overdue. I didn't get to tell my one story about what happened in Maracaibo at midnight, which is, uh, I took my, this is what happens when you get out of the library. I'm advising these other authors to go ground truth it, but I went off to a, the oil fields outside Maracaibo and got stuck out there way past dark, had to, you know, abandoned by my taxi driver and ended up getting robbed by about 12 guys with pistols who came out of a slum area and just sort of stalked me down and uh, robbed me. And, um, you know, I was held at gunpoint and it was a sort of powerful reminder to me that that gun, you know, that gun changes everything. It changes it in politics, it changes it in your life, it changes it in your moment, it changes the power relationships between people. It's terrifying, it leaves scars. Um, and so I always think about that gun and remember that, you know, ultimately what I'm trying to get at in this research is the danger of violence creeping into our politics. Uh, I don't want us to get to that point where you're getting the gun pulled on you. And if Jeff will indulge me for one minute more, I'm gonna tell you what I did in response to being mugged by that guy, which is, I told him I had prepared. I knew I was, you know, Venezuela is very dangerous. I didn't have my real wallet on me. So when he mugged me, 
I told him, okay, I'm going to get my wallet out. And I gave him, I pulled out my wallet, but I didn't give it to him. I opened it up and I just took the bills out and I gave him the bills. And of course, it was a thick wad of bills and it looked really good. And um, <laughs> he was like, wow, you know, a thick wad of money. And then I pulled out some shiny Venezuelan money. It wasn't much, you know, I gave him that. And then I pulled out, I had a $20 US bill and I gave him that. So he was just super happy. This guy's holding me at gunpoint. He's got the cash and this you know, thick wad of cash. And so they left. Uh, and of course, that wasn't my wallet. That wasn't real money. The money I gave him was, you know, a canceled Bolivian currency from the 1980s that you can buy in antique stores in La Paz, Bolivia. They sell it by the pound. So I knew there was going to be trouble. I knew I should be prepared. I knew going to Venezuela would be risky. And I had a uh, fake wallet stuffed with fake money and that's what I gave him. So I say I got away about Eve, you know, I remember the gun, but I think he's gonna remember me as well. And I hope that we, you know, find resilience in responding to these challenges we're facing now. So I've covered a lot of ground and I would love to hear back from people and Jeff get your uh, help in uh, talking about uh, work and the book that I'm working on and where this research will take us. Well, great. Well, let's all give him another Zoom applause here. Thank you very much. All right. So um, we can do this a couple of ways. You can uh, raise your hand in the chat. And there's also some people already sending uh, questions to me in the chat. So I think we'll start out with one uh, from uh, Samuel Pratt in the chat. Uh, how do you do your job interviewing guerrilla groups while staying safe? Is there just a lack of fear? How do you know where to go and what is safe? Uh, there's, the fear stays no matter what you do. I try to be super careful. I mean, one of the things I figured out, I did this a lot, is to go very slowly, do a lot of research. And when you get in country, go bit by bit with accurate local information. So the most common thing to observe is many radical groups, they do want to get a message out. They are broadcasting their word, particularly, you know, say a Colombian guerrilla group, they have a whole, you know, way to contact local media. So I was able to go to Colombia, meet a radio reporter who was in a certain province and would get tips from the guerrillas saying, you know, we're gonna have a ceasefire on certain days. So I said, you know, and this guy, by going with local journalists who are very experienced and are already in contact, you know, I had this rule, which I've used almost always, but is I want to shake the hand of the person who's done it. I want to know from experience, you know, I'm not going to go wander around in the jungle. I want to meet the guy who said, yes, I was with the gorillas once. Here's what you do. Here, I can introduce you to someone who will introduce you to someone. And to do that slowly and carefully, uh, if possible. Great, uh, thanks. Um, uh, Olivia, you wanna, do you wanna ask your question, Olivia? You wanna unmute yourself or do you want me to ask it? Uh, sure, I can ask. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I understand like the United States has like these domestic and extremist movements that, uh, but I wondered why the United States in, when compared to Latin America is different in terms of like the amount of people that actually join. Uh, I think that the U.S. maybe has better security, like in terms of like the government, the military and the civil, like the government and the military are pretty separate, which is a big difference as well. But I think that um, it's interesting that not a ton of people join or maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think, you know, one of the things that's striking at the example of Venezuela, I believe you know the polarization and the accusations of right against left can easily be traced back to the I think the late 1940s in disputed elections so you're talking about 70 years of denial of the right of the other side to have an opinion um, you're talking about a much deeper set conflict we have our conflicts here but until very recently we have not had until currently we have not had much in the way of explicit claims that elections were fraudulent, for example, uh, or separate beliefs until re relatively recently, we've lived in the same world. 
Um, and I think it's less appealing to Americans. It doesn't have the cycle of violence and the cycle of, you know, we don't have military coups in our background. So we have a culture that hasn't gone through what these other societies have gone through. You know, there's a lot of war-torn places that respond with the desire for strict leadership and rescue by a man on a horseback, as it's sometimes called in Latin America. I just don't think we're, that's not our, our tradition. So we're sort of new at this trend. Uh, there are, there is a huge difference between people who maybe show up at a Coeur d'Alene rally in support of militia groups, you know, who tend to be really nice people um, and see themselves as patriots and so on, but they're not necessarily yet yeah, joining groups or jumping over fences or uh, engaging in the kind of preparation for war that you see with some of the more, more radical groups that are, there are real, there are forming, there are growing, but it's always a small percentage um, and it can be hard to read what exactly those percentages are. All right. Um, thank you, Olivia. John, you want to unmute and ask your question? Or I can just ask it for John. Uh, in your opinion, what are the major causes of the increasing political polarization in the U.S.? Sorry, I was I was talking, but I was not unmuted. But there's the question. Oh. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, reasons for the increased polarization in the U.S. and and the world. Um, you know, I I would admit that I'm under the influence of this idea of you know post materialism. I think which is an attempt to say that. You know, one of the things that shows up in this research is that when we, you know, when we get our material needs met, some people become more not liberal in the left sense, but classically liberal in the sense of respecting democracy and the rights of others and being willing to lose an election, say. Um, and, you know, it's a strong tradition with us. Um, you know, to to try to respect that, I think we have suffered a serious blow because that's been challenged just in the last year, but the, res the results are deeper than that. There is a sense, uh, I think in the research, I've seen research that culturally, you know, a lot of it's either culture or economics that drives authoritarianism. When there's economic insecurity, Authoritarian parties focus on that. Authoritarian movements and personalities and people focus on the economic grievance. So say after 2008 in this country, there was a vast mutual uh, populist response, right and left, about what happened, the crash of the economy, the bailouts on Wall Street. You had figures like Bernie Sanders who could attract a lot of support from people on the right and the left. Um, coalitions breaking up, reforming around economic needs. When it, the economic situation is more stable, it becomes cultural things that divide people and are exploitable by parties. Um, and, you know, I think we have this nasty combination of having the success to worry about these things. You know, uh, every time there's an economic downturn, people get very uh, afraid that change is coming especially it's very focused in older Americans. Young people tend to be much more tolerant of other cultures, more willing to see elections play out uh, and come back four years later. It's older people who feel desperate and it's often the cultural change. Um, the research I cited by Pippa Norris at Harvard estimates that 37% of the difference between Donald Trump voters and Hillary Clinton voters was accountable for by religiosity or cultural conservatism, more so than, much more so, significantly more so than economic judgments and factors and beliefs. It was uh, the largest single factor in the difference between the support for Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, culture and religion, cultural change. Uh, you know, for an older person, uh, you know, it can be as simple as hearing Spanish spoken in the grocery store. Uh, that upsets some people. And I'd like to believe that it's politics or that we can structure things or respond in certain ways or strengthen our parties or do these solutions I talked about. But a lot of the research shows that this is 
you know, a deep dyed kind of personality issue, which is being activated in our time, but it's not going to go away just because, um, you know, we have some reform measures. All right. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, Bailey Wilden, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Yeah. Um, so my question was, you said that you um, that about one third of American men demonstrated authoritarian tendencies. And I was just wondering if you have any data about how many women demonstrate the same sorts of tendencies. Um, it is more <laughs> surprise, surprise. Your, your question is a good one. Uh, surprise, surprise. Women have less of it. It is present in women at lower levels. What's striking is, uh, you know, I, the original study I cited from back in 1950 or so by Theodore Adorno, he very heavily focused on white males, but the research holds up across nations. It holds up male versus female. It holds up at class levels. It holds up, it's well distributed throughout. It's true in Australia and it's true in Finland and it's true in India. Um, so I do think, you know, while the, one of the, you know, several of the authoritarian tendencies that get cited have to do with physical punishment, belief in physical punishment, belief in, um, you know, settling things with your fists, to put it bluntly. And those figures are lower for women, but they're still there. It is, you know, there's just a difference among women that's parallel to the difference among men, uh, even though the base level is lower. Okay, great. Thanks, Bailey. Uh, Paige, you're, you're up next. Paige Murphy, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yes, my question was, what do you think is the best way uh, for just average citizens to combat authoritarian regimes is? The best, did I hear that right? The best way for average citizens to combat authoritarian regimes? Correct. Okay. Um, Yeah, let me just refer to I'm trying to find a list I made. Um, you know, in the case of the United States, in other societies, I think institutional reforms or criminal prosecution of you know a leader who's carrying out murders or something are important solutions. In our case, I believe polarization is fundamental to what's happening and stopping polarization is stopping extremism. So that requires rebuilding those ties. And localism is very hard to you know, change the US Senate or its policies or introduce bills. Winning a ballot initiative in your state is more likely to have a big effect. Um, and for me, you know, I took up travel because I felt in just so, when, when I took up travel, when I first went to South America, say, I felt just incredibly strongly the bonding I had with people who are completely different from me, alien experiences, different lives, who, who may as well have lived in different centuries. I think that's also the solution for us as a country, that we, we need to reconnect across these divides. And, you know, there really is no, all politics is local, all solutions have to be local. There's no big, you know, we should be joining organizations. We should be moderating political parties. We should be, um, but I also believe it is just as important is we should be reaching out to each other quite literally, quite, you know, for me to drive across the country forces me to talk to farmers in North Dakota about Antifa. It changes who I am. I can live in both worlds. We're becoming a society where we're separating out, which is so easy, so convenient, so you know profitable to just separate out and live in our separate bubbles. Um, so burst the bubble and go have fun with the other side. I just think that's incredibly important, and it can work. Um, you know, if we personally are the moderating force. All right, thank you, Paige. Uh, Hayden, you want to unmute and and ask your question? Sure. Um, so my question is, how prevalent are racial or 
ethnic narratives fueling political divisiveness and violence in the various countries relating to your book? Okay, hey, I think you know that that is an important question. Um, answer, very. Um, Ethno-nationalism is one of the most important terms to think about now. I think it is playing out in the United States. You've seen it strongly in the cases of the European countries that have turned more authoritarian or have authoritarian parties. So if you look at France, you know, France for the French, Marine Le Pen and the Le Pen family and other rightists there will say, oh, we want traditional France and culture. And they mean, you know, the real French as opposed to immigrants uh, and the same across Europe. I was very struck by the case of the Philippines because it proved to me that while ethno-nationalism is the very most common and most powerful emotional driver, nationalism, patriotism, that is the number one cause, um, Brazil to a lesser extent and the Philippines very much, the enemy was not an ethnic difference. In Brazil, it's often racial. Uh, the people being affected most are in, you know, Max Weber described ranked societies where there's lower orders and higher orders. And traditionally in Latin America, white people at the top, black people at the bottom. And to some extent that, that that's a factor in Brazil. But in the Philippines, there's no ethnic divide. There's no, it's a very nationalistic movement. And what it taught me is that any enemy is good enough. Even an enemy who looks like us and talks like us is good enough because in that case, it's criminals, it's drug addicts, it's you know these desperate poor people who threaten disorder in the society and it's driven by the sense that the middle class is, feels threatened by that and they're struggling to hold on to their, their new middle class status, but it doesn't have an ethnic component. So I deduce from that that Ultimately, any enemy is good enough to drive an authoritarian spiral. It can be an internal enemy like criminals. It can be an internal enemy like, you know, in Venezuela, the traitors who don't support our beautiful revolution. But the most common is uh, ethno-nationalism. And I think that that was part of the appeal of the last four years and the Trumpist movement that, you know, when you're sensitive to cultural change and talking about, you know, I'm from Virginia and politicians always talk about, you know, the real Virginia, as opposed to some other part of Virginia that's less real. And I think that that has to do with ethno-nationalism and racism, frankly. Um, so that can play a factor, you know, uh, in most countries, I think you're gonna find that's the most powerful tool uh, for fear and for dividing people into an in-group and an out-group. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hayden. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions. Uh, Joshua Graham, you want to unmute and ask your ask your question? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you mentioned that authoritarianism is growing in the United States, and I guess my question is: Have you seen that growth concentrated in specific groups or parties? And if so, what are they? Hmm. Um, hi, Joshua. That's a, that's that's a tough question. Uh, I, you know, I think that yes, clearly, you know, Trump supporters tend to be certain ways, not all we're talking about on average, but before Trump, there was the Tea Party, before the Tea Party, you know, uh, Newt Gingrich's contract with America in the 90s, in the 70s, the Prairie Brush Fire, these are all conservative political movements that you know, we're very successful in some ways in politics and, you know, starting a brush fire of excited populist uh, right ideas in politics. The, what's different now is the change toward the belief that the system itself doesn't apply or can't be fixed or is broken, that we're going to hack the system, that we're going to stop the vote count, that we're going to stop all procedures of government. I think that's an expression that's grown as a way to almost sabotage and paralyze government as an expression of, a, of conservative politics or right-wing politics. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think it's concentrated, you know, there's not one ingredient that's concentrating it in one place. This tendency is appearing, you can see it on the left as well and some left supporters like in Portland, you know, violence, the belief in burning everything down and destroying the system. 
Um, and what's fascinating to me is that it's geographically distributed. You know, I was traveling around central and northern Michigan and the number of Confederate flags that you see in backyards in rural Michigan, uh, you know, I'm a Virginian, that just doesn't happen uh, in Virginia. That's very controversial in Virginia, but in Michigan, apparently it's okay. Uh, or it's not okay and people don't care anymore and they're just saying it out loud. So it is dispersed. It could be a guy in Dallas or somebody in Kansas or somebody in California, you know, I, living in the West, I notice a particular Western brand usually around public lands issues like the Bundy movement in Nevada and seizing public lands and so on. But I think it is, you know, it's in Florida, it's evenly distributed to our society now. It's, this isn't, you know, in North versus South or East versus West or cities versus rural. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Well, I think uh, we are about out of time. Uh, perfect. Um, so if everybody uh, in the chat there, you can all see there's a, there's a Global Women's Studies event this afternoon at five. Uh, you can check that out as well. But please join me, join me in giving uh, Patrick Sims a big Zoom round of applause for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.